the P is right here at the top of Schoology. I've not published it yet, but it's going to be right there, just like I always provide them after the practice constructed response test. So it's on you to check your answers and to learn how to do it by the time you come to class tomorrow. I will be checking at the end to see who cares about their grade and who doesn't, but if you want the points, you upload to Schoology. So for unit five, part one, a car that was originally sold for 18,000 loses one fifth of its value each year after it was bought. After four years, how much is the car worth? So unit five was probably the best unit as far as grade averages, but it was a long time ago. Unit five was exponential functions. So knowing that, maybe that could help you set up a way to solve this one. In number two, you still have to set up an equation anyway, so we might as well start there. What's our really basic exponential function equation? It's like how you know linear is y equals mx plus b. Exponential is y equals. Wait, we tell you I'm not gonna. So exponential function. What is their basic setup for them? They tell me that the car was originally sold for eighteen thousand and losing a fifth of its value each year. How do I set up? Things like that. You could make a chart. Wait, what did you say? Expert is quadrat. So exponential, think all the way back from the beginning of the semester. So linear is y equals mx plus b, quadratics is something with an x squared, exponential is what? Basic formula for exponential functions. Um, Consider looking at the node. Google's three up until you know, you take your actual test and yes, you do exponential function. <laughs> Why um, Our slope formula or average rate of change. I don't see that on this part of the test, but average rate of change might come up on the multiple choice part. So something else, exponential function. What's our general setup for those? Well, while you guys figure that out, try to use your critical thinking skills then. Because if this, if you don't know that, then here's what you have to resort to. Okay. A, B, X, like this. Okay. Can anyone fix that? It's not A, B, X. It's not A, B times X. No. Oh. Okay, to the power of X. That is our really basic setup where A stands for what? What does A stand for? Initial amount. So what is my initial amount in this problem? 18,000. Um, B, do you guys remember what B stands for? Or what we do with it? Common factor. So it's what you're multiplying by each year to get like your new value. So if it was doubling, then the common factor would be two. Since we are losing a fifth of its value, remember we're not multiplying by what it's losing, we multiply by what it's keeping. So you might want to use this variation for this problem. It's also about exponential functions, but it lets you put in like a percentage in a way. This fraction is kind of like a percentage. So 18,000 is my initial amount. 
Instead of B, you might want to use this one to help you figure out what B should be. One, is it increasing or decreasing over time? So I'm going to do one minus the rate that it's decreasing by. So it's losing a fifth. So the T power, T being like number of years. So what is one minus one fifth? Four fifths. And four fifths is a decimal that end, so you could put 0.8 as well, and that would still work. Uh, if it wants function notation, then I'd probably write it like this. C of T equals 18,000 times four fifths of the two is the answer for number two. So the number two, it just wants it in terms of time in years since it was released. It didn't want like after four years. After four years was part one. And for that, we would do this equation, but you would plug in four. So it might be better to do number two before you do number one, but you could problem solve your way through it too. Like you could figure out how much a fifth of 18,000 is and then figure out what a fifth of that value is and all that stuff. But set up the x as a function you're probably using. Please, please, please use a calculator for exponential functions. There's really no way you could do them in your head. So please put it all in the calculator at once. I know tomorrow someone will do this. They'll do 18,000 times 4 fifths and then they'll square the 14,000 when if you just put it all in or they'll put that 14,000 to the power of 4 when really like you're supposed to do the exponent first and then have the by 18,000. If you put it all in at once, then it will just do it for you. So after four years, that is what it's worth. Since we're talking about money, how many decimal clocks should I have? So then when I write my answer, it should be $7,372.80. Don't give me some long decimal round it to the spot. That is the end of the bracket. Questions on that? So for exponential functions, you need an initial amount. You need a common factor or like one plus or minus the rate that it's increasing or decreasing by and a time frame. That's what your exponent is. Time. X is equal to time. Good on that one? All right, what other ones do we have questions on? Like the first one would be six. Yeah. Okay. So the expression 16 feet squared represents the distance in feet an object falls after t seconds. The object is dropped from a height of 502 feet. What's the height and feet of the object five seconds after it was dropped? So there's two ways you could go about this. One way could be memorizing like what we did in that unit to get answers to projectile motion problems. The other way is just by like using your critical thinking skills. Like you can just like logically think about this. If you want to know the height in feet that the object is five seconds after it's dropped, and this right here tells me the distance in feet that it's fallen, I probably want to figure out how much it's fallen first. So I would plug in that five for the T. And this is something you can put in your calculator all at once. Again, someone is going to do 16 times 5 first and then square it. When really it should be the exponent first. And it should be equal 400, not, not 80 squared. Not 60. Okay, so put it all in at once. 400 is how much it's traveled. That's not what it asks. It asks how much or what is the height. So if the original height was 502 and it traveled, so things like when you drop an object, should the feet increase or decrease? 
So what math do I need to do to get my actual amount? Initial height, 502, subtract how much it's traveled. And what is its height? 102, that is all. All for that. The other way I mentioned you could go about it, so like number two says write an expression representing the height of the object in feet seconds after it is dropped. You could think about the math you just did in that one and then apply it. So it's like whatever this was, we subtracted it from the 502. And it wants it for T seconds after it was dropped, not just like any time frame. Um, like specific, it wants it to work for any time frame. You really could just write this and be done. Because that's the math you did. Multiply this and subtract it from that. Um, the other way I mentioned that might be easier if you're not necessarily good at just like problem solving your way through things or knowing how to set up a problem, you can remember our projectile motion problem setup. All projectile motion problems have this setup, where this part is due to gravity, the negative 16 t squared, v is for velocity, s is for starting height. So the negative 16 t squared would be there already. It is affected by gravity, and you say it wasn't. Um, it didn't say it was thrown. It just said it was dropped. So we shouldn't expect any like force and velocity. The starting height was 502. So here's the other way you could go about getting the same answer and then figuring out what the height was as well. You use that setup. These are the same. Both have a negative 16 t squared. Both have a positive 502. So whichever way is easier to do. Good on that one? All right, which other one? Annette? First one on the back. Um, first one, you can go over and have a So first one on the back. Unit seven, like I mentioned, you can't just always type things in the dead modes and get the answers. Unit seven is telling you what the answers are. It wants you to show how you find those solutions by completing the square. So say that you forget the steps for completing the square. If you showed all your work with another method, that would get you some points. Not all points, because it wanted a specific method, but like attempt every problem, even if you forget the first, because attempt them all. Get the credit. Completing the square has really specific steps. Is this problem in the format that we can complete the square from? What do I have to do to it? I have to subtract 536 from both sides. Why, you might ask? Because step one in completing the square is to rewrite it into this. For completing the square, it wants to constant on the other side away from the x term. So to do that, you have to cancel it out on one side and then do the same to the other side. So that'll cancel here. Whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. So I get x squared minus x equal to negative 5 over 36. That's step one. If you could even do just step one, I would give you some points. Like, just read right. Put it on one side, just come to the other side. What is step two? Do we remember what we do next? Take half of B, then do what was it? Square it, then, then add to both sides. If you're wondering, like, wow, that's a really random step. You taught me why it was like that in lesson 12. Now it's just you need to memorize it. There's really, like, no way to do it. Taught you it. You can rewatch lesson 12 if you want. Then we condense it to just some really, like, simple steps. Take half of B, square it, then add it to both sides. What's my d value in this? So I'm going to take half of negative one. What's half of negative one? 
I'm going to take negative 0.5 and square it with negative 0.5 squared. So, common mistake I've been hearing today is negative 0.25. It should be positive anytime you square something. So, the calculator is telling you negative, and you need to remember those parentheses around somewhere. But I'm going to take that. I took half of V. I squared it. I could use the calculator for that too. These are decimals that end, so you can just use them as a decimal. You never want to have to round too early. So if it's a fraction or that gives you a decimal that goes on forever, use a fraction version. But we're going to add this to both sides of this, which gives me x squared minus x plus 0.25 equal to negative 5 over 36 plus 0.25. I'll use my calculator to simplify that later. I don't feel like I'm going to break it out, but it'll be simplified. Step three is to factor the left side. So the whole point of completing the square is we want this. We want to create a perfect square on the left side. So we can write it in the condensed form. And there's no longer like two different x's. They're like, it's going to be someone when you factor. So you set up your diamond. It'd be 0.25 on the top, negative one on the bottom. Two numbers that multiply to 0.25 and add to negative one. Negative 0.5, yeah. So that might seem like a hard task to think what multiplies to 0.25 or 1 fourth and adds to negative one. You already kind of did it in this step. It always ends up being half of B. So try it out. It always ends up being whatever half of B was. That's what multiplies to the top and adds to the bottom. So when I write it in factor form, I can write it in this condensed form. So that is easier to solve for X. I still need to simplify the right side. So it's like the calculator. <laughs> I don't even like doing problems like that, but I don't have to use calculators, so I don't have to. Negative 5 over 36 plus 0.25. Press the fraction to decimal button. Like, I don't want to have to round too early or I won't get the right answer. So press this button. And one ninth is what it's equal to. So it's me factoring the left side. Step four is to, yeah, the steps from lesson 12 are super specific. It'll say to square root both sides, solve for both cases. Really just isolate X. Start with what's farther. What's farther, the 0.5 or the two. What's opposite of squaring something. So we're gonna do that on both sides to cancel out the exponent of two there, this becomes x minus 0.5 on the left. On the right, I can use my calculator to square root that. If I didn't know how to already, that's what to do. So one third is what it's equal to. And actually, anytime you square root, you have that plus or minus. So it's plus or minus one third. And you get the two answers. What's opposite of subtracting 0.5? That on both sides. And then when I simplify, remember to solve for both cases. So I have the positive one third. Bring some of them for that. Now positive one third plus 0.5, and that's what gives me the positive um, 5, 6 answer that they said I would get. So they told me the answer. The other answer I get from making this a negative one third, the number of the plus and minus, so make that a negative one third, 
plus 0.5, and that's how we get the one thing. That's how you would get the full one. If you will not remember that or forget, do a different method, show all your work, you just won't get the full one. You said something. Yes? Second question, you slide. All right, so second question on unit five, the equation C equals 1,000 times three to the T represents the population of fish in the size, should say T years since 2014. I'll leave T years since 2014 when the fish population in the lake was first surveyed. What was the population in 2014 based on this equation? 1,000. So you could do that without doing any math, but of course you could always check with your math if you wanted to. Um, we mentioned how it's A times B to the S, where A stands for initial amount. And since this is T year since 2014, how many years from 2014 to 2014? Zero. So that would be already my answer. One thousand. But of course, you could put in the math, like put in your calculator. You could do one thousand times three to the zero power. Please put that in the calculator. Don't assume that you know what three to the zero power. Not zero. See, that's why I said put in the calculator. Three to the zero power is what? That's when you put the whole thing in your calculator. But anything to the zero power is what? So that's what I'm saying. Like, put that in your calculator, the whole thing, just let it do the math for you. Because people can say zero and it's not. Because it's the zero power is one. And then that's a thousand in the end. Now, for this model, what does it mean when t equals negative three? So, what does it mean? Three years before 2014 would be a good answer. If T equals zero is 2014, then T equals negative three would be three years before that. Or what year? So in the year 2011, but both are sufficient. And it didn't even ask what the value is. So you don't have to put the value unless you want to, but you have to tell me what it means. Three years before 2014. Now for T equals negative three, is the fish, fish population more or less than a thousand? So here's where it said, like, please attend all of them. Even if you don't know what you're doing, more or less. I think you can be saying, is it more or less? And how do you know? Okay, that's a good option to do. It gave you the equation. Why not just plug it in and see what it gives you? Um, but also, was this increasing over time or decreasing over time? Yeah, it said it was growing. Yeah, it said it was growing. Or maybe it didn't say it, but you can tell because it's multiplying by three each time that it would be growing as time goes on. If we're talking about like before we started measuring, then um, it's expected to be less. But when in doubt, type it into your calculator. And it's about 37. Show the math that it's clearly less than a thousand. Good there? Might have time for one more. Do you guys want to make a diagram? So like for part two of unit six, since it's a two term times a two term, you could probably set it up something like that. And then from there it's just area. Make sure if it's a negative, any negative, that you keep the negative attached to the number and use that when you multiply, like don't just leave it off because then that says that it's positive. Um, let's see. For the second one on unit seven, what method did you use? It's your choice. 
Factoring and quadratic formula might be the only things you can use because we never taught you to put in the square when you solve it. So quadratic formula and factoring are both doable. When in doubt, you could do graphing. You just might not get all the points, but <laughs> at least you can tell me what the solutions are, right? That will get you some of the points. Um, I'm going to come around and just briefly check, you know, make sure that we care about our grades. 